this is the apartment that I went to in um when I came to interview all those all those years ago. How long ago was that? Like 2015, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I spoke to my daughter, as a matter of fact. I said, Do you remember? She said, Oh yeah, tell her I did write down all my experiences. And she said, if you want to have her on your show, let her know and she will tell you about those experiences. Oh, okay. cool. Well, I'm loving the room. I'm loving the backdrop. It's your career right there, isn't it? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, um, yeah, it's all over the place. It's uh, There's a lot of them. I just, it just makes for a good backdrop, you know, yeah. when it comes to well, this. Well, yeah, thing. why not? It's a, it's a nice reminder, isn't it? To sort I of guess so, you, you know. It's, it's a nice way because you take everything for granted. And I think sometimes it's good to have that there so that you can just see it and go, oh, yeah, I need to stop giving myself a hard time. I did all right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's uh, you're right. One one day I sat there and I, I looked at, uh, I mean, there's like, I'm only going to say this for the purposes of this conversation, not for the bragging rights, but it's under, it's under, but you need to understand, I have 37 gold and platinum records for, as a guitar player, manager, producer, executive producer from a whole lot of different artists, not just Twisted. And they're all in this room. And occasionally I sit there and I look at that and I go, Man, if you showed me that when I was uh, 10 years old yeah. and said that's what's going to happen, I would say, whoa, I must be the most famous person on earth and the richest person on earth and blah, 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 that goes with all the bullshit. But the truth is, you know, when they tell little girls at Disneyland that when you get married to your prince, it's happily ever after, you know, that bullshit that they just give you when you're yeah. young. It's the same bullshit in the music business. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like it ain't happily ever after, motherfucker. It's like the price I paid for that shit. I don't even know if it's worth it. I, meaning, you know, it, it it's the music business is a fucking horrible business, and and you have to have a certain ability to withstand the bullshit of this business in order to succeed in it. It's not just the fact that you want to be a quote rock star. It's fuck that. I you know. If that's all that it was supposed to be, it was never that. So if all it was was one day I said, oh, I want to become famous and a rock star. And then someone said, no, man, to go there, you're going to be exposed to more crap than you could possibly imagine. Meet more fucked up people than you can possibly imagine. Yeah. Hear more lies than you could possibly imagine. Deal with more ripoffs that you could possibly imagine. Deal with mob guys. Be threatened. All the stuff that has nothing to do with playing guitar in a band. You know what I mean? Yeah. Has nothing to do with playing guitar in a band. If it was just playing guitar in a band, that would be one thing. But man, all of this is because of way bigger things and the price one pays is is huge you know it just is unexpected look you read the autobiography you talk you read interviews with george harrison he was the most unhappy guy in the world he was in the biggest band in the world right the biggest band in the world yeah he hated it it's number one he, band it's like the start fucking, the birth of it all yeah the, the whole thing he's why we're here and he fucking hates it and he hated it and he hated stardom and he hated the interpersonal bullshit and he hated the business and and um you know I, I, you know so it, it is what it is you know you work hard and you accomplish certain things and you know i think david bowie has a quote about fame which is also a quote from a tv star named tony danza and i happen to agree with this I happen to agree with what they said. The only value that fame has tangibly is that you could get a reservation in a restaurant when you need it. And if you need a good doctor, you can pretty much get them right away. And that is about the sole fucking value of this shit. I can be JJ French. I can get a good reservation at a restaurant. I can get concert tickets for my kids if I need to, because I make a phone call. Yeah. And when I need to get my heart, my heart surgery or my prostate cancers deal with, I could call up and pretty much get taken care of. Okay. That, that my dear Kylie is about the sum fucking value of rock and roll celebrity. So why then? Why are people drawn to it? Why do they want to do it? Why did you want to do it? You know, what is it? Why does it have this appeal? Well, why do you think it has this appeal? 
you've got guitars on your wall so you tell I'm me sure. i mean uh-huh. i can tell you that but what do you think what do you think i mean you're the public you get you buy all this bullshit that we sell yeah. so what is it about the fantasy of who we are that makes you love it so much well the one thing i have noticed is that a lot of people music that go into doing what you want to do the ones that want to be out there on the stage are like you say the most insecure insecure people ever so it's kind of like it's people that are insecure that have issues that are attracted to this and i guess it's because they think that the adulation that they're going to get from being it's going to validate them it's going to give it's all of a sudden going to change their life like you say and it doesn't it's it's the worst place for those type of people to be yeah it's supposed to fill some sort of a need yeah and it and it never fills that need you know if that's the need you're after you will never find it no you will never find you know there's a there's an old saying a comedian once said something about cocaine, which I, I quote a lot because it applies to this too. And, and what the person said was that in, that this person was in college and some guy comes up and says, hey, man, you want to do cocaine? Yeah. And the guy goes, and the person's never done cocaine, right? So he goes, well, why should I do cocaine? And the response is, because it makes you more of what you are. And he said, well, what if you're an asshole? <laughs> so so what does all this fame bring you well if you're an asshole you're just bigger you're just a bigger asshole (laughs) oh yeah and god knows man the world doesn't need bigger ones i mean we have enough that we have to deal with and you got to deal with the fucking idiots in this business you know as a manager and an artist it's even more complicated because you know artists make fun of managers managers make fun of artists i think one of the funniest comments i've ever heard from a manager about an artist is that the manager goes the thing i hate most about this business is that i have to pay the artist 80 percent of what i earn <laughs> that's a great one that is uh, i'm then, not sure i necessarily agree with that though yeah well then there's People another one which is the, art. the other one is that the art of management is doing the unnecessary for the unappreciative yeah which, that's which is true. another one and then my definition of an of a management is managing an artist is like is like putting a saddle on an atomic bomb and holding on for as long as you can before the fucking thing blows up <laughs> you know and it invariably it invariably does you know also i was interviewed years ago uh, by VH1, and they said to me, "Man, you know, there's so few manager artists. Like you're one of the few. Like Mick Fleetwood is one, mm-hmm. Steve Miller. I mean, it's very few because it's very different skill sets, you know. Yeah, sure. And 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 when I realized that I'm not really a musician, I'm a I'm a businessman that plays guitar. You know, I'm not a musician first. I'm much more practical than that. But when they asked me the question, I, I had until that moment, I never thought of the answer to that question." And it kind of came to me in this kind of like epiphany of the best way to explain the differences between an artist and a manager. And I said, well, you know, when you go to a circus, usually most circuses at the end, the elephants come out as that closing part of the circus and they walk around the arena, you know, and yeah. and, the, and the mothers and the kids, the, the, the tails and the, you know, then that's what they do. The, the elephants come out. That's like the big finale. The elephants come out like the elephants. And at the last elephant, there's a guy with a with a broom and a, and a garbage can sweeping up the elephant shit behind the last elephant. You know, that's the manager. Okay. okay? And the elephant is the musician. You got yeah. <laughs> Oh. So, oh my God. so I've been sweeping my own shit for years. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like uh, the best way I can put it. Anyway, anyway, here's a way to illustrate this to you. When I was 10 years old mm-hmm. and I saw the Beatles on TV, like everybody says, they saw the Beatles on TV. Oh my God, changed their life. Oh my God, I want to be that. And when I was, when I was 10, I was, I was, what was it? it was, uh, it was February 64. So I was, I was 11. So I see them on TV. Oh my God. That's what I want to do. Whatever that meant, what whatever the fuck that meant, like whatever whatever stardom meant, which was I think a gold record. We all knew what that was. Maybe like you know, you get a gold record must mean you're billionaire. You know. Yeah. So at the moment I saw the Beatles, at that moment, at the age of eleven, if someone had put their hand on my shoulder and said, "Okay, John, you will have a gold record," I would go, "Really? When would that be?" 
And the answer was 20 years and six months from now. I think I may have said, fuck this. <laughs> I'm staying at school and <laughs> getting a degree. I mean, you know, ignorance is bliss. It took 20 years and six months from the day that I saw the Beatles on TV to mm -hmm. stay hungry's first gold record, I think, or can't stop rock and roll's first gold record. That's yeah. a hell of a time jump. No, you know? Well, that's what I was going to ask you, given what you, um, you know, everything that you've said, it's kind of like in hindsight, would you have gone into the industry? Would you have done what you, you did? It, well, you know, it, my like mother wanted my mother wanted me to be a lawyer or a politician, and my father wanted me in the jewelry business, and both of those options were not appealing to me for various reasons. Uh, and I dropped out of high school pursuing my dream. You know, I mean, the day I dropped out of high school in my senior year, the quote to my mother, by the way, and I was a drug addict at the time and drug dealing at the time in order to finance my guitar needs and amplifier needs and concert needs and drug needs, you know. How old were you at this time? 17. So I dropped out of high school in my senior year. And uh, when I informed my mother that I was dropping out of high school, she said to me, you've got two months left to go. Why would you drop out? And I said, yeah. you don't understand. I haven't been in school all year long. They're yeah. going to fail me. I'm failing. Uh, I have not. She goes, what have you been doing? I said, playing in bands, dealing, you know, hanging out and, the, and the, you know, never in school. So I said, they're never going to pass me this year. She said, well, and then she said to me, basically, well, what are you going to do with your life? You know, and I said to her, don't worry about me. I'm going to be a rock star. That was my quote to her. And the purpose of that quote was She's to shut her up, oh was just to shut her up. Cause I just wanted to, cause what I'm going to say, oh, I want to become a drug dealer, you know, professionally. That's not the answer. No. So I, said, I said, don't worry about me. I want to become a rock star. Just shut up. And um, and then and then over the years, as the band was struggling and we were faced with constant um, rejections, that conversation played back in my head over and over and over again, you know, like, Mom, I'm going to be a rock star. And I think sometimes some of those tough days, some of those tough nights, I remember that conversation and it pushed me further to continue on the journey until it happened, because by all rights, the journey shouldn't have happened. You know, we were turned down more times in a bed sheet in a whorehouse and we've come back more times than Freddy Krueger, my dear. <laughs> I love it because it, I was going to, I was going to talk to you because we've started this interview. I love it that we just get straight into it, which is how it should be. But like, you know, when I obviously read up about your, your, your childhood and stuff and, and your dad being a jeweler and your mum was, she was quite, she was into politics and stuff. So was she quite, I know that when you, you left school and everything, and she was angry at you, but were they quite supportive in a way? For you? I mean, what did they think about you getting into music? Were they, because they gave you a guitar, they let you have one. Well, I mean, I bought my own guitar with money. I made drug dealing pretty much. I mean, that's what's what happened. And, and you, did you teach you yourself know? or did you have lessons? No, I taught myself. Because, mm. you know, you know, let's put, let's put the 60s in context here. Yeah. This is not John alone in a vacuum becoming famous. This is John the hippie in New York City with thousands of other hippies mm. in New York City, all doing roughly the same thing, all dealing, all taking drugs. Right, yeah. All drug addicts, all going to the Fillmore East every weekend to see Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, because it was all there every weekend. No big deal. Not the fact that you could see the Who for three bucks t 10 times in a week at the Fillmore. Not a big deal. That's just how it was. Yeah. Nothing was a big fucking deal. It was just the way it was. And there were thousands of us, okay? And I think our parents as a group, at least in New York City, at least in my world, mm -hmm. all the parents kind of just gave up and just went, fuck, we don't understand this shit. Yeah. I mean, this was the hippies. This was the this was the youth the revolution. Height. The height and, of it. and they all lost control. It's not like my parents lost control, but everybody else's parents were fine. They all, they, I, I feel like they all just kind of waved a white flag and goes and said, let's just hope they don't die. I really think that's what it was. Let's just hope they come home at night. Let's just hope, because we never called our parents. We never asked our parents. I mean, none of my friends did. It wasn't nah, just me. You didn't have mobile phones either, so yeah. they had no idea where you were. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was in Europe dealing drugs for two months. I called my mother one time. 
once because why first of all there's no mobile phones second of all you go to the post office to make a long distance call third of all every hippie in the world is in europe fourth of all the line is four hours long so you finally get your one 60 second slot after waiting four hours to get to a payphone to stick two guilders in in amsterdam to get a long distance operator to call your parents and Tell them there's a person to person call, which they won't take because it was $10 a call, but they know you're alive because you asked them to do it. And that's what you did yeah. one time. Let me tell you this. You ask any parent today of a 17 year old person, how would you feel if your kid called you once in two months? You'd die. <laughs> You'd die. They'd kill you, right? Yeah. They'd fucking kill you. I mean, text me, call me, whatever. Where. So um, this was a group think. None of our, you know, None of us cared what our parents said. None of us gave a shit what our parents said. No one paid any attention to their advice. Yeah. And our parents pretty much went, okay. And the the downside of that is a lot of my friends died. That's the downside. That is, lot, yeah, exactly. Lot, lot, lot of, so, so I can make a joke about all this. I can make an observation about all this in hindsight with, with 50 Six, 55 years of hindsight. How bad was the tragedy of the 60s? There was a lot of loss. Okay. Casualties, yeah. A lot of casualties. And while it was fun, while, yes, going to the Fillmore and getting fucked up on every drug on the planet Earth on a weekly basis and seeing every band you ever wanted to see and having musicians in the park bring their electric guitars and showing you a little guitar riff because you wanted to learn this song this week and that kid knows that song and mm -hmm. he'll show it to you. And then the next week you go to the park and there's another kid with a guitar and he knows that song. We all did. It yeah. was not John French uh, living in a vacuum uh, composing this life. This was me participating, you know, yeah, in, yeah, this sure. in this world, you know? Okay. So how do you, how do you feel being, like you say, you have this, you know, 55 years of being in the industry and stuff. And how do you think that it compares to the music industry today? And maybe starting out as a young musician, because obviously, you know, you're heavily, you're heavily involved in that side. Now you're like, you know, looking out for young bands and producing, you've done lots, you've written a book, you do public speaking, like you've kind of covered a lot in your time. Yeah. But I'm also pragmatic, uh, really pragmatic. So let me let me put this in context for you. I am 70 years old. If a 20 year old kid comes up to me for advice, a 20 year yeah. musician, if I'm really nice, I will say to him, "Listen, man, you know, um, you got to just find your own pathway because there's nothing I'm going to tell you that you really need to know." And I will tell you why I'm saying that. All right, it's not that I don't want to impart knowledge to this person, but let's look at this realistically here. When I was 20 years old and Twisted Sister started, um, I didn't look at anybody and ask them for advice. I just said, I want to, I'm going to figure, you know, I, I'm ready, I'm prepared now to be in a band. I'm good enough. And if I join a band, we'll figure it out. Like, we'll figure it out. We'll see what other bands are doing and we'll copy it for a while. And then we'll figure it out. That's how I looked at it as a business person. If I, I let's say in my building, in my apartment building, there was a, there was a professional mus musician in my building who was 70 years old. Okay. And, um, you know, he was a professional. He played saxophone and, you know, and he's 70. I never asked him for his opinion. And had I asked him for his opinion, this is what he would have said to me. He would have said, John, he said, I was born in 1902. <laughs> and, and he goes, and I got into my first band in 1920 when I played in a hotel sitting behind a, a female lounge singer yeah. in a hotel, because that's what you did in 1920. And he goes, there was a hundred people in the band. And then I went from that to another band. And he goes, the point is nothing I did has any fucking relationship to what you are confronted with right now. Yeah. So he, if he was honest with me, besides saying, you got to work hard, kid, you got to play your instrument, you got to dedicate yourself. But if he was actually telling me about a career path. Nothing he would have said to me mm -hmm. would have been worth a fucking penny. Do you understand? Yeah, I do. So I say to bands today, you're asking the wrong fucking guy. I said, you're an idiot to ask the question, because if you really want to make it, look around at what your contemporaries are doing. 
-hmm. and follow that path. You know, I say to bands all the time, before you are the Beatles, you better be better than the band next door. And until you're better than the band next door, you ain't shit. So don't come asking me to give you a leapfrog job. Fucking be better than the band next door. Look at the other friends who are 20 years old in bands. Look at the ones who are 23 years old in bands. Maybe they're doing shit with social media you're not doing. Figure it out. I don't need to figure that shit out. I'm, you know, I'm up there through it and past it. And I really, my book is about a general business book, which is advice for any business. My business is about is about um, the the larger picture of how you function in a business world, and it doesn't matter if it's a band or if it's a shoe salesman or if it's a steel company or an airline. The rules that I laid out were were very broad based business rules that apply to every business. But when a twenty year old kid comes to me. Nothing I'm going to tell this person he can relate to. Here's another example of how that that's the case. When I was 20 and the band started, there was a club scene. Drinking age was 18. We had yeah. thousands of clubs, thousands of them. And there was thousands of bands, right? Mm-hmm. So you got to put a band together. And if you played well enough, you could get an agent, stick you in a, in a club playing cover material, five shows a night. And that's how you got good. And you did it night after night, year after year, which is what we did, right? That's what we did. Okay, drinking age was 18. Gasoline was 29 cents a gallon. Hotel rooms were $19 a night. Nice. A house, rent, a house rental was $300 a month. A truck rental was 20 bucks a week. That was my world. That ain't your world. <laughs> drinking age is 21. There's no clubs left. There's no record labels, really. Uh, truck rental is 1000 a week. House rental is $5,000 a month. Yeah. Nothing I'm going to tell you has any particular value to what your life is like. Here's another thing. Band will say to me, hey, man, you know, you should see my band. And I go, really? How many shows you played? Oh, we played about 50. I said, really, 50 shows? How long have you been together? Two years. I go, oh, two years you played 50 shows. That's admirable. I said, when you get to 500 shows, let me know. I'll come and see your band. And they go, 500? We'll never get to 500. And I said, well, there's a good chance I won't come and see your fucking band because your band's going to suck till you hit about 500 shows. I don't have the time to watch you suck because I'm sure I sucked at 500 shows. Now, let's be real here. If you're telling me you played 50 or 60 shows in two years and that's a great accomplishment, do you know how many shows we played in the first 30 months of the band's existence? 3,400 and 50 shows. What does that have to do with anything today? Well, I know, but the problem is with today, and I don't want to generalize new bands, but a lot of them, there is that, that is the problem. A lot of them aren't out there playing shows, and that is the only way you get good. It's how you get musicianship. It's how you you hone your craft, isn't it? Well, one would think, but, you know, obviously people get signed by not doing that. They do. They get signed from just being in their bedroom playing guitar. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> and that's weird, right? So so I could sit there and go, oh, it's not like it was in my day. In my day, we didn't have electricity. and we had ele-. No, I don't begrudge people for what they do. I mean, everything changes. You know, if that's the rules of the game, that's the rules of the game. Listen, I am doing a guest spot with a band called Adam and the Metal Hawks in New York in, in two weeks. I'm, okay. And they're great. They're really great. They've only been together for like six months and they play like 10 shows they happen to be spectacular musicians and the lead singer adam um was like on american idol he was like a finalist on american idol okay so he's get... got more experience in playing like i was you've gone back on what you said there no 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 no. listen to what i'm gonna say okay go on, then. I'm gonna say. okay adam and the metal hawks have played maybe to... now they're managed by my tour manager Right. Okay. So, of course, I'm going to go down and see the band. Yeah, 100%. I support everything he does. Yeah. So I go down and see the band. Now, the singer is a bona fide great vocalist, like Freddie Mercury, great vocalist. Yeah. And the kids in this band are 18 year olds. And I went to see the band, expecting it to be terrible. And they were great. And their originals were really good. And I, and I said to the man, anything I can ever do to help you? In terms of just like being there, you associate my name with it. JJ Friends likes me, but whatever. I don't give a yeah. shit. So they asked me to play with them. So I'm going to play a gig with them in a couple of weeks. And I'm happy to. But here's the point. I asked them how they make money. They do social media work. Wow. They promote themselves through social media. 
Yeah. And as influencers, and they make a lot of money. Nice. My point being, that wasn't my world, right? That's their world. Yeah. And if that's what their world needs to do, then that's what you do. Like, it beats, it beats flip, flipping burgers and pulling pints, doesn't it? Well, to your point, to your point, Ray Davies of the Kinks, yeah. a quote, he, he gave somebody a quote years ago. Someone says, how does it feel playing You Really Got Me over and over and over and over and over and over again? By the way, to people who don't know You Really Got Me, it's not a Van Halen song. <laughs> it is a Kinks song, okay? And, 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 and he said, they said, um, how do you feel playing that? Now, you could say to me, how does it feel playing Under the Blade? 5,000 times. And I'll tell you, I'm a professional performer. If you, you're paying me money to play the song, I'm playing the song. Hmm. The best way I can play it, because that's my professional job to do that. But anyway, Ray Davies said, are you out of He said to the person asking the question, are you serious? Play You Really Got Me? Flip hamburgers. Play You Really Got Me? Flip hamburgers. So, yeah. so if you're a musician, you'll do anything you can not to flip hamburgers. Okay? The people who really succeed, succeed because they've really killed themselves to it to succeed. And most people don't kill themselves to succeed. When you go to a concert and you're looking at, you know, at like the Berlin, uh, the Berlin Philharmonic, which comprises some of the greatest musicians in the world. And, you know, you look at the, you look at the violinist, and there's 20 of them and there's one chair. That's the head chair, the lead chair. Why is that person the lead chair? Cause that person has been doing it for eight hours a day for 20 fucking hours. Yeah. And that's why that person is doing it. And you're sitting on your fat ass. That's exactly why. And let me tell you something. It's boring as shit to yeah. do that person did. And it's boring as shit for Twisted to have played thousands of shows in the bars. You know, we made it a party every night. You don't think that that was a monotony. You don't think that night after night after night after night, week in, week out, month in, month out, year after year, plus putting up with all of the rejections doesn't kill you? Yeah. The truth is that me, D, Eddie, and Mark withstood an awful lot to get to where we got. And the people who didn't make it, I mean, AJ came in towards the end, kind of like Ringo with the Beatles. He came in towards the end before the Beatles yeah. got signed. And luckily for him, he didn't have to spend all those, you know, years in the whatever. And AJ doesn't mean AJ didn't play in a lot of bands. He just didn't struggle with us. But there's there's a uh, twelve other guys that were in Twisted Sister at one point or another, and there's a reason why they didn't make it. You know why? They couldn't put up with it. Yeah. They couldn't handle the work ethic. Work ethic, work ethic was brutal. And I think you know enough of our history to know it's not bullshit. It's real. No, I know. Definitely. 100%. I mean, I I, I take my hat off to you to, to be able to kind of stick with it like you did and just, you know, keep your vision and go, do you know what? Just let it all, you have to be thick skinned and you have to let it wash over you somehow without it affecting you. So, so, uh, you know, it's impressive what you guys did. Don't for a minute. To. But don't for a minute think that it didn't take its toll. That's the point I'm what I'm saying to you about yeah. about the value of what these records mean to me.